Please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Ariana Huffington. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That's it here. You want this? Can I grab my iPad? Oh, sorry. All right. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming back. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Can you all hear me? Because you have to deal with the Greek accent. <laughs> the Greek accent comes in loud and clear. <laughs> it's perfect. It's so. I know you were here a couple of years ago uh, in connection with your Sleep Revolution tour, and uh, we were just so excited when, uh, when you accepted and said you could be here. Um, I want to talk about a few things today. Um, your entrepreneurial career, um, how you've switched from several different fields and industries, uh, and then I want to dive a little bit into deeper, uh, deeper into mindset, sleep, and the importance of that. First of all, I want to say that listening to you speak uh, was just such a wonderful experience because I spent a lot of my life trying to convince people of what you are about and what you are studying here and convince them that it is a competitive advantage. That's why I don't like work-life balance because it makes it seem like there is a trade-off. There is no trade-off. They rise or fall together. So listening to you was absolute joy. And I want to also say that I'm particularly excited to see Dean Willoughby here, who is a dear friend and uh, was with me on the whole Huffington Post journey. Do you all know she was an amazing senior editor at HuffPost? So that, that was an extra bonus. Well, it's, she's just a wonderful partner. We've, we did uh, an event called Scale together. She interviewed our Entrepreneurs of the Year. And uh, we, we find smart people and we, we get close to them. And she's just been a great leader for us in the university. Oh, so and we're... also, let me not forget. <laughs> what I'm holding, which is a gift from Glenn Fox, and he actually made it himself because wood cutting is his hobby. Every week he does wood cutting. Did you know that about him? <laughs> he is, so, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the story of why Huffington Post and why Ariana means so much, and this involves Glenn. I was gonna tell this at the end. <laughs> um, we're here, the Performance Science Institute is, is sort of here and, and consists of our team because of Huffington Post. When um, Pete Carroll, Mike Gervais and I, and, and, and Bill McMorrill started formulating the vision for this institute, um, I read an article on the Huffington Post written by a neuroscientist at USC's Brain and Creativity Institute. And so I'm thinking like, who do we get to, to run this institute? You know, we want someone who's a thought leader, who's, a, who's an academic, who publishes. And so there's a student in my class who's here, Max Henning, who took my class three times. And he's a neuroscientist, so I said, do you know this guy, Dr. Glenn Fox? And he says, yeah, it's my mentor. <laughs> and he, so he introduced me. He introduced us, and, uh, and here we are, you know, a year and a half, two years later. So the Huffington Post is part of our Oprah full circle moment of why we have <laughs> as, the performance as we sciences. Say, as we say in founding circles, it's part of your origin story, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're an you're, you're, you're official and unofficial part of that. I think what I, I want to start with is, is mindset, because what fascinates many of us about you is the variety of your career, not just the variety of your books and the topics and the things that you, but you've gone from being a, you know, a, an author, political commentator, entrepreneur, wellness advocate. What gives, you know, can you share your mindset on how you approach new opportunity and how you give yourself permission to do new things that maybe you might not be the most expert at at first? What a great question. And I, and I love your emphasis on mindset. So for me, um, a lot of um, my career can be explained by the fact that I had this amazing mother who really taught us from a very early age that there is no problem with failure. Uh, she used to say, failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is a stepping stone to success. So I think very often what stops us from trying new things or following new passions is the fear that we're going to fail. And failure is a real possibility. It's not as if there isn't. So as an example of that, um, when, uh, when these issues that you are studying here of performance and wellness and productivity became paramount to me. 
Um, I brought them into the Huffington Post, as you know, we had dedicated sections, starting with a section on sleep in 2007, when I remember a, um, a discussion of my board at the Huffington Post saying that I was basically crazy to have an entire section dedicated to sleep, and now you can hardly open the Wall Street Journal or The Economist without having pieces about sleep and performance. But so when these issues became more and more important and I really wanted to spend my life on them, um, I started thinking of leaving the Huffington Post, which frankly I had never contemplated before because it's a little bit like a third child. You know, I have two daughters and the Huffington Post. But, <laughs> <laughs> but by 2006, I felt I really, really want to do that. And I remember actually walking with Willow, which is where we have our most profound discussions, and, and telling her that. And she gave me this great advice. She said, take a deep breath, close your eyes, and jump. Because there's really no cost-benefit analysis you can do. That was kind of what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And um, that meant also being open to the fact that the Thrive might not have worked. I mean, we're lucky in that it did work, I think because it tapped into a moment in the culture, into the zeitgeist. But I was leaving a very successful global company to launch a startup again. <laughs> uh, so I think having a, a mindset that encompasses failure and is not afraid of failure allows us to um, to change careers, to do new things, and to be constantly learning and innovating. And, and I think it's so important for students, particularly at a school like USC, to hear that because many of them are here with you know near perfect ACT and SAT <laughs> scores and want to get 4.0s and want to get into grad school and the right job. And so that, that push to be perfect. Or, or perfect, perfectionism. Is perfectionism a good trait for an entrepreneur? It's a terrible trait for any human being. <laughs> and trust me, I have um, two perfectionist daughters who went through a lot of problems as a result, including anorexia and including serious problems, which you know, are outcomes of perfectionism. And, and I've suffered from it myself. I had to really learn uh, to deal with my perfectionism, which leads to self-judgments, which are the most draining thing I, I remember uh, when I started speaking at Cambridge, and I was a terrible speaker with an even heavier accent than my accent now, and literally I would prepare for my speech, I would speak, but then what was the most draining part was the exhausting self-judgments that followed for hours or days. I mean, do you identify at all with that? <laughs> So I think if we can eliminate these self-judgments, learn from things we could have done better, we always could have done better, but in an objective, observing mindset, rather than a let's tear ourselves down mindset. I hope one of you innovators here will, will create um, a little tape recorder that we can attach to our brains to record our negative self-talk. Because I think not even our worst enemies talk about us, the way we talk about us to ourselves, uh, often because of this misplaced perfectionism. It's, you're hitting so many of the things that like, are so vital to what we're trying to create. So it, it was funny, um, Dr. Brene Brown, when she was here, she said, if perfectionism is driving the car, then f f fear is the annoying Backseat, fear is riding shotgun and mm. shame is the annoying backseat Amazing. driver. So there's so That's much judgment that you yes. have there. And so you know, managing our self-talk and how that leads to esteem and confidence or the opposite. Um, so who is the obnoxious roommate that I've heard that you've referred to? Oh yes, so the obno is, obnoxious roommate is the name I give to this negative self-talk. And in fact, uh, when I was on Stephen Colbert's show, I told him that my obnoxious roommate sounds exactly like him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he had to find a place to crash. <laughs> so now I have, I have cultivated little by little this mindset of observing my obnoxious roommate rather than identifying with my obnoxious roommate. And as a result, now she's only making guest appearances. <laughs> 
th that is tremendous progress for any human. You know, we, we live inside our minds. Our, 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 you know, our narrative is sort of who def what defines who we are, what we can accomplish. And so getting some habits and mental skills around that I think sooner in life, as I, as I told you, God, if I knew these things when I was 20 and didn't have to live through another you know, 30 years of anxiety and you know, stress and all the other things that we carry with us, that's the point of these things is how do we give them a better uh, you know, tool chest and framework for, to live a better life. Great, great stuff. Um, speaking of, of sort of uh, you know, switching careers, um, when you started, and I don't want to get too political, it's not political, you started uh, as a conservative political commentator, so even that, switching to, and I don't mean to sort of define it, but you, you moved away from that. Um, can you tell us about that, with that transition or what caused that movement in your philosophy? Yes, it was much less dramatic than yeah. it appears because at the time, um, <laughs> I, when I was a conservative, I was a pro-choice, pro-gun control, pro-gay rights conservative. <laughs> Do you know any of those right now? <laughs> Uh, so my shift was in my understanding of the role of government. And I understood that to solve major social problems, you need the raw power of government appropriation. So that was really the shift. And, um, and I also find that increasingly, and that was really my policy at, at HuffPost, uh, we need to move beyond right-left distinctions. Because the major problems of our time, like growing inequalities, like climate change, like the epidemic of drug addiction and the opioid crisis, they are not right-left problems. And I think while we continue to identify them as right-left, it makes it harder to solve them. So that's one of the problems with these um, very, very obsolete uh, definitions in our political system. Yeah, I think sort of being boxed into accepting all or none of you know, a, a parties or an ideology. But you know what, increasingly, I feel there are going to be no political solutions until we learn to access our deeper wisdom. That's why I love the word access that you used. It's like right now, people are operating on the surface of who they are. You know, frenetic, breathlessly moving from one thing to another, sleep deprived, exhausted, burnt out, making terrible decisions. You know, the problem is not that we have leaders with low IQ. The problem is that we have leaders with very, very low levels of wisdom. And you cannot access, well, you know, I'm not just talking about the present occupant of the White House. <laughs> I'm talking from the, the, you know, every day you have new examples of people literally falling asleep at meetings. You know, Ross Wilbur the other day, the Commerce Secretary, fell asleep at the meeting. And we need to actually recognize that these are major problems. When you have exhausted, executives making decisions, they're going to be operating from the lowest point of who they are. We know that from ourselves. I know that when I'm exhausted, I actually do not like myself. You know, I'm reactive, I'm emotional, I'm more judgmental of myself and others. I make worse decisions, I'm not as creative. In fact, I was speaking at a Facebook um, leadership conference recently, and I asked all the engineers there whether they could create a button where I could unfriend myself during those times. <laughs> so the same applies to all of us. So right now, that's why I'm so sensitive to, to use the language that you're using. What is my mindset at every moment? Because when I move, to that mindset, I know I'm not going to be the best version of myself. And the same applies to examples of leaders everywhere, including, you know, if you look at the, a lot of the, the examples of misconduct, you know, I'm not talking necessarily about the worst examples, uh, which obviously show some very fundamental um, human uh, shortcomings, but a lot of the um, unprofessional behavior um, is, is connected to burnout. Um, again, because if either you're operating from the better angels of our nature, or you're operating all the way in the continuum from the worst demons of your nature. Can we return to sleep and mindfulness uh, in a bit? I want to touch all the bases because I know we have just so many different Absolutely. groups Absolutely, you're here. in charge. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> that, that's the appearance, of course. Um, but what I, I want to do is, is, is um, 
dive into your, your entrepreneurial career, and just not that it started with the Huffington Post, but that's certainly when we learned about it. But can you know, we, we try and teach students at the Greif Center and at Marshall, you know, to, to find an opportunity, find a niche, you know, where you can have a sustainable competitive advantage. What opportunity did you see? Because in the era of, you know, instant, you know, abundant information, how, what was the vision for Huffington Post and what competitive advantage did you see in that? So the competitive advantage that I saw um, was that uh, we're living in a very different world. For many of you, it may be hard to remember that 2005, when I launched the Huffington Post, there was no Twitter. Uh, there was, I think Facebook was a sort of a university dating site. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and it was a very different world. You know, the world of platforms um, was very nascent. And I wanted to... Um, create a platform for people, some of them very well known, some not, with interesting things to say, to be able to say them in a civilized environment. So to deal with the worst aspects of what was already then happening on the internet, you know, trolls and abusive comments, etc. Um, but also make it easy for people who could be writing op-eds for the New York Times, but might not because they didn't want to spend all that time um, submitting things to editors, being edited, etc., to be able to do it. So uh, that was the, the first and, and dominant kind of uh, goal, as well as increasingly creating a journalistic enterprise. So, the, so I started by literally sending emails to my 500 closest friends, inviting them to write uh, on um, the day we launched. And so on the day of launch with people like Larry David and John Cusack and Walter Cronkite and Ellen DeGeneres writing, and suddenly we began to elevate blogging. Because remember, in 2005, bloggers were assumed to be people who couldn't get a job writing um, in their parents' basements in their pajamas. <laughs> you know, that was literally the, the, the stereotype. So by bringing in people who could be writing anywhere, we actually began to change um, that perception and also to allow people, like I remember Norman Mailer um, sending me an email, it was a lot of people were just emailing me the blogs at the time, um, saying, I don't know if you remember the, the Newsweek um, flashing the Koran down the toilet controversy. He, he sent me an email saying, here's my piece on that. He was writing what turned out to be his last novel. He wanted to be part of, uh, of the cultural conversation of the moment, but he didn't want to take a lot of time away from his novel. It took him 20 minutes, he did it. The great defining moment for the Huffington Post was when Nora Ephron, who was an editor at large, uh, wrote a piece about Deep Throat. Um, on the day that um, it was revealed who Deep Throat was, she was inundated by request to go on CNN to write for the New York Times because she was at the time married to Carl Bernstein. And she called me up and she said, you know what, I'm going to write a blog for the Huffington Post uh, instead of putting makeup on and going on CNN because she knew something which everybody knew after she did that blog, that it didn't matter where you wrote it. If it was news making, it would suddenly be everywhere. So she was quoted by the New York Times and by, the, and by CNN. And so that's really when HuffPost became a place to go when you wanted something to say and it was, and, and we made it very easy for them. We even had a concierge service that especially for those living in LA, you could call in from your car and dictate a blog post. <laughs> and then we would then send it to them and, um, and they could edit it if they wanted, we would post. I remember taking dictation from Ari Emanuel on the golf course, writing a very newsy piece about Mel Gibson, <laughs> um, who's changed the perception of how Mel Gibson was seen at the time. So that was the beginning of Half Post and the, and the idea behind it. And then, of course, making it into a real journalistic enterprise with investigative journalists winning um, a Pulitzer, et cetera, et cetera. But it was the combination of 
elevating um, conversations and, uh, and, and a journalistic enterprise. And, and I'm glad you gave it context because if, if you're an undergrad student here, you were five to nine years old when it launched, and they've just grown up with HuffPost and sort of the idea of bloggers. And you know, you're among the first to invite people to participate openly. Everywhere you went, every time I met you, you just go, please write something for yeah, no, HuffPost. I... <laughs> and you're always selling and always growing it. Can you? And give... I'm doing the same now for Thrive Global. I want to. <laughs> Because the Thrive Global Media Platform is, think of it, half post, but only about these issues that, that you are studying here at the Performance Institute. Only about how do we live our best lives. And, um, and so, to make it super easy, I'm going to give you my email address. So you can email me, we can email me, we can give you an, your own account and you can write whenever you want. And we don't care where else you post it. Because Thrive Global is not about exclusivity. In fact, our saying is ubiquity is the new exclusivity. And we don't care if it's new. If you published it two years ago, or if you posted it on your Facebook two years ago, and it's still relevant, we want it. Because we want the best content from people all around the world. Thrive Global is global. Uh, because our goal is culture shift. And the more people participate in the conversation, the fastest we are going to change the culture. And we already have 20,000 contributors. And uh, the goal is to accelerate that. Just to give you an idea, when I left, half was at 100,000 contributors. So within a year, Thrive Global has 20,000. And I think, again, that's because we are tapping into a very profound need among people to stop living their lives in this frenetic, breathless way. So the, the mission of Thrive is to, to, that underscores that you don't have to, you know, burnout is not a requirement for living a healthy and good life. And, and so let, let's talk the, the I was going to say the, the benefits of thriving. Or the, well, when, well, so let me step back. Explain what services you provide as a platform, because it's not merely the Huffington Post for wellness articles. You provide services because it's a business and you have revenue and income and all that stuff. So explain what services Thrive provides. So uh, you know what is interesting is that we never use the word wellness without coupling it with performance. Because we think this is the only way to get away from seeing wellness services or wellness content as soft and fluffy and a nice to have and seeing it as an essential part. So Thrive Global has um, three parts. The first is the work we do with corporations. Uh, we have major partners like Accenture, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman, the Hilton Hotels. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, um, not only will you be able to have a commencement speech ready because I, I, I publish so many inspirational quotes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but also you'll see you know, all our clients and what we're doing. I just flew in from Tokyo yeah, last night, but I did get my eight hour sleep, don't worry. And, um, and we did, we're doing a lot of work, for example, with the Hilton Hotels. So we, I was meeting with all the Hilton general managers about how do you create um, a culture where your employees or team members, as they call them, are thriving because from that place they can help their, um, their guests thrive. It's very hard for exhausted hotel employees to create a thriving experience uh, for you as a guest. So, um, so the first part is we go into these companies and help them um, improve their culture uh, invest in, um, in their employees and then measure the impact on business metrics. Whether it's attrition or um, productivity, engagement, healthcare costs. Um, every company has different priorities. When we launched with Accenture, for example, we've done already 100 trainings for them around the world. Um, their primary pain point was attrition. Do you know how many people Accenture on boards every year? 90,000. So you can imagine attrition is a big problem. 
um, recruitment may be another problem, burnout another, especially in the finance sector. So let me give you another example. At JP Morgan, we launched with a global challenge to all their 200,000 employees. Uh, launched from the C-suite. It's very important that all these initiatives are embraced by the C-suite, not just the HR department. And so the, um, our global challenge was for them to work on t for 28 days on, of, on one of four things, sleep, unplugging from technology, gratitude, or mindfulness. And so, for example, you had Kelly Goff, the CEO of the private bank, saying what she was going to work on, and the CMO, what she was going to work on, and we even had Jamie Dimon. So basically, everybody felt they had permission to work on these things. And we had 64 participation, they won an HR award, it was a big success. And then we continue with sustainability newsletters that reinforce these practices. And that's where the media platform comes in. So the media platform is both a standalone media platform, um, that brings together the latest science about all these issues that you are working on here. Glenn, we want all your articles published in that section. Uh, and new role models, because human beings learn through a combination of data and stories. So first, they need to be convinced by the latest findings of neuroscience that they're going to be more effective if they take care of themselves, as we know from athletes. And you know, in our, we have a, an e-course, um, and the first uh, module is on sleep and meditation, and our guest teacher is Kobe Bryant. <laughs> because oh. we deliberately bring athletes into Thrive Global, because they're all about performance. They're all about winning. They're all about having a competitive advantage, and they know that if they don't sleep, if they don't take breaks from their phones, they are not going to be able to be good on the court or in the field. They lose that edge that you need to win, especially at that level. So by bringing in new role models, we also help convince people that super successful people in our world are actually already practicing a lot of these things, but they don't talk about it until recently. Often we have to out them. <laughs> so when people, and I'm, this is kind of, I'm passionate about outing successful people's life hacks. <laughs> so whenever, I mean, I was at a dinner sitting next to Jeff Bezos um, a couple of years ago, and he told me that he sleeps eight hours a night. And he said to me, I do that because it's the best thing I can do for Amazon shareholders. And he has analyzed his decision making. It was incredibly detailed. He said to me, when I get a six hours sleep, I have noticed that my sleep is five to 20, my, sorry, my decision making is five to 20% less good. So I said, you have to write about that. You have to write about that. I bagged him, I emailed him. <laughs> So finally, he wrote about that on Thrive Global. It became crazy viral. People were amazed. People at Amazon didn't know that about him. And the same thing, one more example of our role model series, because I want you to be all part of this series. I was um, talking at an event with Philip Schneider, who is the chief business officer at Google. And he said to me, I had an epiphany moment. Um, last Saturday. He said, I had come back from a trip. I told my children, who are very young, Daddy is taking you to the playground. And my five-year-old daughter said, oh no, can't the babysitter take us? <laughs> and I was crestfallen, he said, and I asked her why, and she said, because when you're in the playground, you're always on your phone. So that was the moment when he promised himself when he's with his children, he's not going to be on his phone. So guess what? I started badging him. <laughs> Phil, you have to write about that. You have to write about that. And he did. And the most amazing thing was he sent me this email saying hundreds of people in his org, he has this large department that he runs at Google, emailed him and felt empowered to do the same thing himself. 
So that's why I'm so much of a missionary about that. People sharing their stories touches others more than anything else. So the third part of Thrive Global is our products. We just raised um, our Series B. We raised um, $30 million with the IVP uh, leading our Series B and Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, um, being the second big investor in the Series B. And the goal is to take all the IP we've developed and productize it. Uh, so our IP consists of eight pathways that help people bring all these positive mindsets into their lives, broken down into journeys, broken down into micro steps, because people change through micro steps. And uh, so now um, we are hiring about 50 uh, engineers and product people. If you know anyone or if you are one of these people, please let me know. My email is ah at thriveglobal.com because by productizing everything, we'll be able to scale to millions of people really fast. We'll still keep our live trainings and workshops. We have about 50 trainers around the world, but you can't really scale just with live workshops. That's a great summary. And, and I think what we're in the same area and learning from, I love that you always mention performance with wellness and there's some other things that we're always saying, you know, Glenn is a, Glenn's a hard scientist and so you always want to yes. make sure you come across as a scientist because there are plenty of people out there talking softer topics. So always combining that, you know, how do you improve individual performance? Then how do you spread that to an organization? And then how do you measure it? And so I think you're, you're on the cusp of an emerging field that we want to be in, which is, it's HR, but it's, it's not HR. As you said, you sort of get a buy-in from the higher uh, executives, but it's not HR. It's how do you uh, how do you improve individual performance and mindset? How does it lead to cultural improvement? And then how do you measure it with you know whether it's AI, data? We have data scientists here as well. So I, I think this is a really exciting time to improve people's lives and improve productivity as well. And improve um, company outcomes. Right. You know we saw that um, you know at Uber for example, I spent many months. Um, working on, on uh, the changes at, at Uber. And it's a great case study of a hyper-growth company with phenomenal success um, that did not take care of the culture. And the culture has now affected the business metrics. So I think it's very important to realize the culture is not something nice to have. It's absolutely essential. I, I call culture a company's immune system. Because the truth is that you are never going to eliminate um, bad human behavior. You know, you're, we're not going to um, fix human nature overnight. So a healthy, strong company culture identifies problems very quickly and solves them. A broken company culture does not do that. And so the problems um, become worse and worse until they actually affect business metrics. Yeah, and uh, you know, that was very public, obviously. And you know, a culture for, for good or for worse will uh, sort of define how the company performs ultimately. That was sort of a stark example of that. And, you know, as a founder, you know, we've got entrepreneurs out there, you define the culture. And a lot of times it's a reflection of your personality, a reflection of your values, your personal philosophy. And, and Uber was that. And I don't mean the, the bad things that happened, but, you know, Travis was a fighter. He is a fighter. You know, in order to take on, you know, the taxis and cities and the mob, you have to be a fighter. I mean, he had to be. But some of those things don't translate as you grow, as you build a culture. So it was interesting to watch that play out. And, and you obviously had a central role as, a, as a, a very active board member. Let's dive into a couple of the topics. We're going we're gonna to let students ask some questions in a few minutes. But you know, let's talk about stress and exhaustion and anxiety. Um, it doesn't affect anyone in this room. <laughs> but in, in, many, in many respects, we live in the greatest period of human history. Um, we've wiped out or can treat you know, most diseases um, that used to kill millions. We know more about what foods to eat. We have you know, meditation and mindfulness 
are sort of widely accepted. Technology allows us to, to, to shop for anything, to watch performances live on the internet, to select a partner with a swipe or a click. Like all these things technology has made more efficient that should save us time and should give us a better life. And yet people seem more stressed, exhausted, and depressed than ever. So many factors contribute to that. Let's talk about two. Um, the idea of work as martyrdom, and then the second one we're going to talk about is, is phones and devices. So, you know, what, you know, the, the American work ethic of, you know, we work harder and longer and, and uh, we're the hardest working people in the world, um, you know, all of those things. How are you trying to change the view of work? Well, first of all, it's kind of an amazing delusion. And at first you, you wonder how come millions of people, not just here, but all around the world, believe something which is scientifically, as Glenn would vouch, false. And I traced it back to the first industrial revolution. Because during that first industrial revolution, we became kind of enthralled with machines. And the goal of machines and the goal of software is to minimize downtime. You know, Salesforce brags, you know, 99.9% .9 uptime. But for the human operating system, downtime is not a bug, it's a feature. You know, just go back to the myths of creation in every culture. You know, God created heaven and earth in six days, and then she took a day off. <laughs> <laughs> After all, we're celebrating Athena, my favorite Greek goddess. <laughs> um, so that was really a very important message. You know, after all, God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Didn't really need to take a day off. Sending us a message, which we have completely ignored. And now we know categorically that people who actually take time to recharge, to fully recharge, at night through sleep, and during the day with small little breaks. And again, that's why I love the latest neuroscientific findings. They show that you can take 60 seconds and rewire your mind away from stress. So we're not talking like about taking a long time. It's just little, little pattern interrupts during the day. When people talk about meditation, you know, meditation starts with conscious breathing. So you can start with consciously inhaling and exhaling for a minute and it will interrupt your stress pattern. So that's why this is kind of this amazing period when we can actually end this delusion. And if you wonder how come we are still in the grip of this delusion, um, I went back and studied um, addiction to cigarettes. We knew from science, long before the culture changed, that smoking was dangerous for your health. But as late as the 1960s, when the science had been inconclusively, you had doctors in white coats advertising cigarettes. I went back and looked at these ads. You had literally doctors saying, I smoke mentals because they refresh my throat. Yeah, they also give you lung cancer, but... <laughs> so, um, that's really why I'm so passionate about this topic, as you can hear. I, I feel that there's so much suffering in the world, and I've always really felt there's a lot we can do to, to alleviate human suffering. But in so many areas, it's very hard. You know, we look at refugees, we look at poverty, we look at unemployment, but this is an enormous amount of human suffering that we can change simply by changing people's beliefs. That's why your work is so important. And uh, if you think of it, 75% of healthcare costs and healthcare problems, 75% are stress-related and preventable. And while, as, uh, as Dave said, you know, we are so good now at uh, solving so many diseases. Many of the stress-related diseases that are lifestyle diseases are getting worse and worse around the world. Diabetes, um, high blood pressure, all these things, uh, depression, anxiety. 
And that brings us to your second point, which right now is a huge priority at Thrive Global, and this is our relationship to our phones. Because phones are the new cigarettes. And um, Jeffrey Fowler, uh, the chief technology correspondent at the Washington Post, wrote a great piece about what Thrive is doing in this field. And because we just launched an app called the Thrive app to help you navigate your relationship with your phone. And Jeffrey um, said, if, if, if our phones are the new cigarettes, the Thrive app is the nicotine patch. <laughs> So um, we launched it in partnership with Samsung. So for the first six months, we launched it a week ago. It's exclusive to Android. So anybody who has um, a Samsung Galaxy 8 phone can get it downloaded directly on the Samsung Galaxy 8. If you have any kind of other Android phone, you have to go to the Google Play Store and download it from there. For those of you who have um, a, an Apple, an iPhone, uh, you have to wait for six months. <laughs> but it's worth it for, uh, for the culture because um, um, Samsung is, uh, is launching a big marketing campaign uh, in February about this. So it works very simply. Um, if you are doing any work when you don't want to be distracted, or if you're spending time with your family or your loved ones, or if you're meditating, or if you're sleeping, anything you are doing where you don't want to be distracted, you put your phone in thrive mode. And uh, super easy, it's a beautiful interface that uh, Jess Gochner, who is the designer of Moneyball and a lot of great movies designed. And so if Dave is in thrive mode and I text you, I'll get a text back that says, uh, I'm in thrive mode until such and such a time. So it's bi-directional, which is extremely important because we need to change the culture. So we need to go from um, bragging about being always on, which is the current culture. You know, Dave is amazing. He returns your text right away. We want that to be, we want to move to Dave is important enough and has a clear sense of his own priorities and what matters in his life to go in thrive mode if, he have, if he's having dinner with friends and doesn't want to be distracted, if he's doing deep work, whatever the reason. The other thing that the app does, it gives you a mirror of your social media consumption. <laughs> so it will tell you. Let's take Glenn as an example. Glenn, um, you spent uh, two hours on Instagram today. I'm sure he didn't, but. And then the, the app will ask you, would you like to reduce it? And if you say no, it's fine. If you say yes, you say by how much. Let's say you say yes, I want to reduce it to one hour. It will give you notifications. And when you get to one hour, it cuts you out. <laughs> so. Uh, we are really, really excited about it because we believe we all, including myself, are getting more and more addicted. It's having a huge problem, particularly on teenagers and people who are digital natives. Uh, I mean, you, I, I just did a podcast um, for our podcast series with Brian Grazer today, and he has a new book coming out called Eye Contact. Mm -hmm. And Eye Contact is is becoming less and less common. You, you, I mean, you go to restaurants and you see people at the next table, like on their phones while they're having dinner. Uh, you see parents um, on their phones with their kids. It's having a, an incredibly destructive impact. And if you think of it, this is the moment to course correct. Because we, you know, the iPhone is only 10 years old. We had assumed it's all for good, and now we know it isn't. We know there are terrible unintended consequences. Um, 2017 was the year of the Great Awakening. In fact, I have a post that I wrote on Thrive called The Great Awakening, when we realized there is a dark side to tech. And we all love tech. I mean, I'm sure all, everybody here I mean, knows we wouldn't be here without it. But we now need to set boundaries to protect our humanity. So in the same way that we celebrate augmented reality, we need to celebrate augmented humanity. And 
if you think of it, when electricity was invented, people may have wanted to keep it on all the time, and then they realized that, you know, if you turn the lights off at night, you get a better night's sleep. That doesn't make you anti-electricity. <laughs> In the same way, if you take a break from your phone, it doesn't make you anti-technology. It just acknowledges what you said earlier, that we need to access our own wisdom and our own strength and peace, and we can't do that if we are always connected to our phone. As uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said, it has never been easier to run away from ourselves. It's, uh, it, it, there's a couple paradoxes in that, you know, it was the same thing when uh, Andy Pudicum from Headspace came here. How do you, how do you create distance and, uh, and mitigate the time on your app? Well, use our app. <laughs> you know, how do you get yeah. distance? So, but yours has some, some no, real but restrictions. No, it's a paradox, it, which it, is fine, because truth is paradoxical. Is. That, you know, you using technology to help us disconnect from, from technology is yeah. going to be happening more and more. And, you know, you, you think about it, you know, we don't have a chance against, you know, the, the teams of psychologists and neuroscientists at, you know, Facebook and Google. I think you know, what makes this, in some ways, you know, nicotine's a good, um, a good example, but it's, it's different because it does rewire our brains, our ability to focus, our ability to concentrate, how long we can stay on task. All of those things have been affected. And I, I also think, our, you know, devices um, capitalize on our most basic primal instincts, which, you know, are to belong, to be connected. Um, to be validated. To be validated. I mean, what do you, if you think of it, what is a like? A like Approval. is the most ludicrous example of validation. Literally, take somebody less than a second to like the photo of your salad from lunch. <laughs> but people, you know, especially young people, but even older people, you know, obsess over how many likes they do. They literally kind of filter and double filter, you know, this presentation of their lives, um, which is so different from what actually happened to them. Uh, I was talking to Laurie Snyder, who is um, the chief technology correspondent at CNN, and we were talking about that. And she had posted a picture of herself looking glamorous in Mexico. Um, just with a caption about her fabulous life. And she said to me, you know, I had just broken up with my boyfriend, I was devastated, and I had been on a hike alone where I got vertigo, and I thought I was going to die alone on a mountain. <laughs> and then that was the picture. <laughs> so we, we want to start a campaign together to help people realize that this is ridiculous because then other people look at that and compare their own um, painful experiences, which are an inevitable part of life, with their friends' amazing lives. And that's why we have this um, epidemic of depression, anxiety, and suicides among teenagers. It's something that I, I think this this generation is going to have to deal with even more than, than ours. Uh, but uh, it, it's so basic to everything we do. We use it. They have them open in classrooms. We're trying to stop that because they're not paying attention in many cases. Um, well, actually, the, you can use Thrive Mode. You can actually... Uh, for, for the students when, who have Android. Uh, yes, when, the, when Thrive Mode is available on iOS as well, you literally could say, everybody in Thrive Mode during the class. And, uh, and you can have a barcode so you know that they are all on Thrive Mode. Theaters. Coming after you. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> uh, theaters can use it. I mean, isn't it unbelievably irritating? No matter how many times you tell people, turn your phones off, some phone will ring during a performance. Now you won't be able to get in the theater without showing your Thrive Mode barcode. Uh, concerts, I mean, really. More and more artists now are asking people to put their phones down and just watch and listen. You know, all the people who take videos of the Adele concert or um, the Taylor Swift concert, I want to do a study. Maybe we can do it together. How many people ever go back and look at it? <laughs> you know, it's obviously dreadful quality, <laughs> right? And all that it means is that it stops you from actually being present and enjoying the concert. Otherwise, watch it on TV. 
It's, watch it when it's streaming. So we need to really just get a grip of ourselves. And <laughs> yeah, it's nothing like you know, being at a wedding watching you know, parents and grandparents hold up iPads. They're watching the iPads of the yes. wedding. It's just sort of those interesting things. Um, this is the last question before I open up to students, USC students. If someone can move the mics forward so they can see Ariana when they ask the questions, that would be great. Um, you've, <laughs> God, we could go on for hours. But I, I want to end this part uh, before Q&A. We're just sort of talking about your personal philosophy because uh, as part of mindset and uh, it was really important to figure out who you are. Uh, it's really important to figure out who you are and what you stand for. So. Have you developed a personal philosophy that you can share with us? Um, not just at Thrive, but sort of your own personal philosophy? And, um, you know, did you take the time to do the... Absolutely. I love that Did question. you take the time to, to do the hard work and write it down? <laughs> did, did you do that? Actually, Thrive, uh, the book Thrive, uh, is all about that. And, uh, but the development of my personal philosophy actually began when I was 17 and went to India to study comparative religion at Shantaniketan University. And that's why I wanted to uh, launch the first Thrive Global outside the US in India, because India has been very important to me. So in January, we launched Thrive Global in India, and I did an open letter to India uh, with the Times of India, which is our partner, um, about both the incredible addiction to technology in, um, in India, which is worse than here, which is the same all over Asia, uh, but also the fact that we, the wisdom of the Indian culture can help us recalibrate where we are. And for me, very simply, um, my philosophy of life is that everyone who is alive has a place of wisdom, strength and peace in us. Uh, the eye of the hurricane, if you want. That no matter what goes on outside, we can access that mindset from which we can deal with any problem, any crisis, from a centered, wise, and creative place. We all have access to it. This is our um, human birthright. But we ignore it. and. Uh, we instead think that life is about how much we are doing, how long our to-do lists are, how much money we have, or how successful we are in the conventional sense. And so for me, that is the most important part of life. And when we access that, we are also better at everything we want to achieve out in the world. And whatever religion you are, or if you are not, if you are not of any religion, Whatever philosophy you study, whether it's the Stoics or the Lao Tzu and Tao in China or um, Zen in uh, Japan or um, the Bhagavad Gita in India, they're all saying the same thing in different ways. And that's now, and that's why this moment is so important, all this ancient wisdom is now being validated by modern science. Right, Glenn? That's why this is an incredible moment. That these are not just wise traditions of the past. These are hardcore, scientifically proven ways to, to, to lead our lives. And, and what I love is that a lot of very successful people are practicing these things. I, I just had a meeting with the CEO of Yahoo Japan a night, two nights ago. And he was telling me, oh, I take time at least once a month and I go to this little farm, he showed me a picture uh, where I have no devices, nothing. And I, I, I just hike and I'm with nature and I need that in order to be able to come back and have, as you would say, the mindset from which to, um, to achieve and create. And, and of course, what did I say? I said, you have to write about it. <laughs> and yesterday he sent me the piece, which Today, if my editors are fast enough, or tomorrow if they're not, it will be on Thrive Global. <laughs> um, and again, his assistant was there, and she didn't know about it. 
So, you know, the amazing thing is that people don't talk about it, even to the people closest to them. And that's why we need to make sure that, uh, that people's own philosophy of life is shared with others so that we can change the culture faster. You have this, you, students, jump up, line up, we're getting ready. Come on, move, move, move. You're in my class, you know what to do. And um, would you mind uh, telling us your name and what you do and, and, I, and, I, and I, anything? Yeah, name, year. And you just have to, you seem to have a unique ability, you know, at least in these two instances, to see the big pattern of change, whether it was Huffington Post or whether it's Thrive Global, and say, I can see this shift and how do we take advantage of it? So it's the perfect mind of an entrepreneur.